Good morning, church. It is good to be back with you. We missed you all. Uh, Church there in Brunswick, Georgia, salutes you. It's good to be back, though. Jim mentioned that bulletin and that small word, all, which is such a giant word in the pages of the Bible. We need to always consider it because He demands our all because He's given us His all and He's given us our all. So it is everything. And I I like to, to harp on this a lot because there are all too many people that fall short because of not understanding that word all. Not understanding what it means to really be a Christian. We do not do Christian things. We are Christians. And thus everything we do ought to be Christian. We don't study the word of God and contemplate what he has given us and strive to be sanctified only on Wednesdays and Sundays. Again, it is who we are. Thus, no matter where we are, like that blessed man of the first psalm, we are meditating on the Word of God day and night. Not just Wednesdays, not just Sundays, but always. Now here's the the thing that's required. You've got to take this Word and you've got to put it inside you so that you can meditate on it. Think of a, a cow out in the field. What do they do? They eat a bunch of grass. Then what do they do? They ruminate on it. Literally, right? We too must take the word of God, put it inside us so that we can ruminate on it and be thinking about it because it strengthens us. It teaches us about God. Here's some examples. Here's an example and then the sermon. I had the the fortune to be able to go to the beach last week with my family. So, so there we were on the, in the Georgia Bight. If you don't know what the Georgia Bight is, it is the farthest, no, it is the most western part of the east coast. Okay, the United States kind of looks like that down in that area, and this is the Georgia Bight, okay? That area has an unbelievable tide surge over six foot, about every eight hours, six foot, the tide goes up, six foot, it goes down. Next to my mom's condo there in Brunswick, there is a canal that runs right from the marshes. And at some part of the day, you'll look out there and you can barely see the reeds because it's just water all the way through. And then seven hours later, it's all mud. There's hardly any water in there at all. And then you think about the incredible volume of water that moved, okay? You are at the beach, and there are times when when the tide is in that you're at the hotels, and it's right there at the breakers. The water is right there. There's no beach. And then seven hours later, there's a huge, vast beach you can go and walk on. Think of the volume of water that's moving. Coming in, going out. Coming in, going out. And you know what, brethren? It's clockwork. I can go on my phone every day because we like to go to one place and then we like to walk on the beach all the way to another location and walk back. And you better know when the tides are or you'll get stuck and you won't be able to walk back because there won't be a beach. It's clockwork because... It makes you think of what God said to Job, right? He said, did you create the oceans? Did you set the boundaries of the ocean? Did you tell the ocean you may come this far and no further? Because brethren, on that Georgia Bight, there are houses that have been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. Some of them as long as 300, 400 years, okay? That coastline has been there for thousands of years. Why? Because God is in control. 
And he's created this incredible tide system so that the water can come and move. Imagine if there were no tides. Imagine if the ocean was just a large, salty, fetid pond that didn't move. It would be disgusting. But no, we have this constantly churning, yet constantly controlled, gigantic, two-thirds of the planet water. And how did he accomplish that? He gave us this moon, which is unlike any moon we've ever seen. Through all of our astronomy, we've never seen one even close to it. So large. Why? Because God is in control. And he made this world for us to live in, that we might choose. So even these basic things of nature teach us about God, remind us about God, and fill us with awe at his power and his loving providence. Always mindful of God's word so that no matter where we are, that's what we're thinking about. Things will make us remember. Things will give us insight. Even things that you might not think would. With myself, this morning's sermon, what about working out in the gym? I like to listen to music. And unlike other members of my family, Deirdre, <clears throat> I can't listen to like 80s light rock music when I work out with weights. It just, I can't listen to Survivor, okay, while I'm trying to work out. It's not going to work. Um, I need something a little more metal. Okay, to get me motivated. And so there was a group that I'd started listening to. And they had a song that I knew about that I didn't put in my workout playlist. And yet we had a song service one Sunday night. And I was here and the song that we sang was The Rose of Sharon. And I remembered this band has a name or song called The Rose of Sharon. They spelled it with a Y, I don't get that, but anyways. Um, so after that service, I added it to my playlist, and I fell in love with the song. And this morning, you're going to be subject to three lines from that song. The name of the band, I'm only going to say K-E. If you want to know more, you're going to have to ask. Um, but this morning's sermon is what we can learn from K-E with regards to to evangelism, specifically the motivation to evangelize. Three things, three lines that will help us to not only be saved, but to please our Lord more and more. The first line, I mourn for those who never knew you. Two main words we're going to focus on from this line. The singer was writing about the fact that he mourns for people who never knew Jesus. The first word to consider is, what does it mean to know God? What does it mean? What does it entail? Because it's of the utmost importance, isn't it? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8 we read that the two groups of people that will be destroyed when Jesus comes back, the two groups of people that will be visited with everlasting condemnation when our Lord returns are those who do not know God and those who do not obey His gospel. And, and understand that second one. To know God and to not obey His gospel is not to know God, is it? So really it's those who don't know God. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, off quoted. God said to the northern kingdom of Israel through his prophet Hosea, my people, Israel, is being destroyed. Why? Because of a lack of knowledge. Well, what did that mean? Did they not know of God? Of course they did. They had heard of him. They knew of his commandments. They were worshiping him regularly. But that word know means so much more. It's the basis of a, of a relationship. To not only know of, but to know him intimately. To know who he is. To know what he demands. To know the kind of God he is. To know the relationship he wants, that he offers, and the relationship you can have. That's what it means to know God. And our Lord 
in Matthew 7 and verse 13 said and declared that the overwhelming majority of people in this world at any time do not know God. They are lost and condemned because of their lack of knowledge. And, and, and who are these people that don't know God? Let's unpack that a little bit because sometimes it's easiest for easy for us to say that it's them and, and maybe not look in the mirror. Those who don't know God indeed are those who deny the Creator, to deny that there's any God, despite the clear revelation of God. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4, we read, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utters speech. Night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. What did he say? He said every aspect of the creation, whether it's the rising sun in the morning, whether it's those beautiful stars at night, they speak of the existence of God. And it's a perpetual sermon every time we look around. Isn't that what Paul wrote in Romans 1 and verse 20? It's been made apparent to everyone. The physical creation removes all excuse of man to deny God. And what did that same Paul say in Acts 17 and verse 27? You remember he was preaching to the Athenians on Mars Hill. And he said, the fact that we know God that we can see him in the creation, that he created us all of one blood, it causes us to seek him. And do you remember the word he used? To grope for him. And I love that imagery because that's the idea. The idea is we can, any honest person can look out and see, where did this come from? Where did we come from? How can we be so different from animals? And, and obviously there is a God. And then we should seek him and it's kind of like blind people trying to find. We're groping for him. And our good God has given us everything. So some who don't know him, indeed, they deny there's a creator. But some people who don't know God believe that he exists. But they refuse to seek him fully. And because of that, they set up and establish gods of their own creation. Yes, there was a God who created everything. Let me tell you about him as I make him up in my mind. They have an idea of God, but they want to make it in their own image. How often has man done that? From the beginning. Think of 1 Kings chapter 12. Not the beginning, obviously, but Jeroboam. He knew where Jehovah God was to be worshipped. He knew how Jehovah God was to be worshipped. Yet, what did he do? Because of his personal ambition... He set up his own worship. Well, didn't he know God? What does God do with those who do not worship him according to his commands? Does he accept it? He never has. From Cain to the end, he never will. And yet, there's Jeroboam. He knows God, but he doesn't know God. Otherwise, he never would have done that. And he and all his family suffered from it. And eventually, that northern kingdom destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Let's bring it in a little closer to home. In Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the talents, uh, it's become more and more significant the longer I walk with my Lord. The one talent man, you remember? He was given only one talent. And when he was called to give an account of what he had done with what God had given him, his master had given him, what did he say? He condemned himself with, from his own mouth, didn't he? He said, I knew you, Master. I knew you were a hard man, and I knew that you reaped where you had not sown. I knew that you expected profit from what you did. Thus, I took your talent, I buried it, and here it is, I give it back to you. And the Master said, you say you knew me, then why do I have no profit? Why didn't you at least put it in a bank? And get me some interest. See, he said he knew him. But did he? 
No, otherwise he wouldn't have acted that way. The true is for the so-called Christian world who say they know Christ. And yet, are they Christ-like? Are they submitting to the Word of God in all their heart, soul, mind, and strength? There's that word again. All? No. They worship in their own way. They even devise salvation in their own way. They take Jesus and make a variation on a theme. Has he ever given any idea that that's acceptable? No. Quite the contrary. Example after example that he will destroy those. Think of our Lord's words in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Lord, we knew you. We did so much in your name. And what did he say? I don't know you. I never knew you. Inside even the church, brethren, there are people who come to the right assembly, who perform the right acts of worship, but do not do it right. Not with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And thus, it is as if they never worshipped or ever came. And Jesus will say to them, just as he said to those others, I never knew you. Not I didn't know you, or I knew you once, but then you disappeared. I never knew you. Because what does it entail to know God? It takes a desire that's more than life. It takes an effort that entails all of our life. It comes down to a submission. He says, do this, my natural instinct, desire, urge, proclivity, is not that. Which will I do? And then that transformation. That's what it means to know God. And it takes everything that we are, all the days of our life. The singer mourns for those who never knew him. Why? <coughs> Brethren, to know God is to be like God. Isaiah 55, 8, 9, I know you've heard me speak of this. We read, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, God speaking to Israel, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And people take this and they abuse it like they do Deuteronomy 29. And they say, well, see, God's ways are above our ways, so oh well, we're just different. But that's not what he's saying. Yes, there's a degree that God is, of course, above us. But what he's saying is, my ways are up here and your ways are down here. Come on! Your ways should be my ways. Why? Is he not our father? Were we not created in his image? It's a rebuke, not a statement of simple fact. He's saying, my thoughts are up here. Get your thoughts up here. My ways are up here. Get your ways up here. <coughs> To know God is to think like God and to feel like God. Why would the singer say, I mourn for those who never knew you? Because what does God do for those who never knew him? Is he happy? Ezekiel 18, I take no pleasure in the soul that dies. In contrast, what do we hear from God? <clears throat> in Hosea chapter 11, this people that have been false worshiping, worshiping other gods, not listening to God despite prophet after prophet, what does he say to them? What does God say to this rebellious and stiff-necked people? He says, how can I give you up? How can I make you like these nations I've destroyed? Do you remember what he said? My heart churns within me. What did Jesus say in Matthew 23, beginning in verse 37, looking over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The city that kills the prophets that are sent to you. How many times I've wanted to gather you to me like a hen gathers her chicks. But you are not willing. 
Behold, your house is left desolate. That's God's heart toward the lost. What is ours? Do we mourn for those who never knew him? Why do I say that? Because, brethren, <coughs> it's easy to become cold and have our heart be seared. They had their chance. They've got a Bible. We send them house to house. I talked to them that one time. Brethren, what is God doing? He is mourning for those who will not come. We must have that soft heart. That will motivate us when we see those people that are lost and we see them as the, the wayward children of God. Our Lord's lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. And instead of saying, at least I'm not like them, or saying they had their chance, or even saying, well, I hope they come to Jesus. Brethren, how are they going to do it without you? <coughs> Our hearts must be broken always for the stranger who denies God, for the stranger who makes up his own God, and for our family members, spiritual and physical, who walk away from God. We must always mourn, never rejoice, never be okay with apostasy. Now, we don't allow that, that sorrow to immobilize us, but nor do we allow that sorrow to be turned into something else. Our hearts we are called to our hearts to always be soft and always hurting. Why do we have the weeping prophets? Why did Jesus weep? Because he loves us so much. And what did our Lord say? What did he say from the very cross? You know what was done to him. Unimaginable torture and horrors. They spit upon him. They were ridiculing after doing that torture to him. And what did he say? Oh, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Can you imagine that kind of love? I mourn for those who never knew you. We must. Second line. What would I give to behold the smile, the face of love? Jesus has done all that for us. Jesus has said all that to us. What would we do to see him? Is that your desire? Is that your greatest joy? That one day there will be that trumpet There'll be that shout, and there's going to be that face, that face I only want to see, that my whole life is lived trying to see my Savior who died for me, saying, well, well done. Enter in. What would we give? John talked about that incredible joy in 1 John 3 and verse 2. Imagine that day that comes when we can see him face to face as he truly is. Jesus talked about the fact that he would come back and we would be together forever. We would have that joy. And even then, he's going to take all of us together and then he's going to take us to the Father. And we know that no man at any time has ever seen God, but we will have the opportunity to see that God that created all, that gave us all, that came and died for us all, and we get to see him face to face. What would you give to behold that smile, that face of love? Would you be willing to turn the television off and study your Bible so that you could be better equipped to fulfill his joy, which is that all his children be saved. Would you be willing to put your phone down?
and talk to your family about Jesus to ensure that they know God? Would you take the time to go speak to brethren who have walked away from the faith? Would you be willing to put yourself in uncomfortable situations, get outside of your comfort zone to reach out to strangers who deny maybe there is even a God? even to reach out to those who have vehemently rejected God. Now, there are times we have to change our approach. If we try to talk to somebody, brethren, side note, you got to listen to yourself talk. I listen to my early preaching. and You know what I hear in my early preaching? I don't hear a lot of love. I love but speaking about such a serious thing can come across a little, a little hard. We need to speak to others how? Speaking the truth in love. And even then, I don't want to hear this anymore. Okay, I won't speak anymore. Does that mean I stop living the gospel to them? Does that mean I stop caring and trying, scheming anything I can do? Do you scheme? Do you have somebody you've tried to reach but they don't want to hear from you anymore and so you try to see if there's anybody in their sphere that you could contact and say, look, I understand this person works near you. Could, could you just try anything to reach them? What would you give, brethren, to have Jesus meet you on that day and say, thank you for trying so hard to reach that child of mine. Thank you so much for all that you did trying to reach that child. And we say, but Lord, they never listened. And he says, I know, but thank you. I love them so much and it means so much to me that you did that. Thank you. In Luke 17, <coughs> we have the rich man and Lazarus. And you remember that the rich man asked that, that Lazarus be sent back so that his brothers, the rich man's brothers, would believe God, would know God. And you remember what Abraham said? Abraham said, no, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Brethren, what do our neighbors, our family members, everybody in this world, what do they have? They have Moses and the prophets, but they also have me you and anyone in their sphere what would you give I don't want to hear of anyone being condemned but I would be okay with hearing this but my servant Rick tried he talked to you over and over he appealed to you over and over Jesus to Rick thank you brethren what would I give for that Hopefully, heart, soul, mind, and strength. The time of my life, which is the gift from God. Those two things especially will motivate us. Because to know God is to love Him. And to love Him is to desire to see Him and to serve Him. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. Read it on your time, brethren. He says that statement. Christ who is our life. Yep, I know that verse. Did you hear it? Christ who is our life. Christ is a very important part of my life. Nope, you missed it. Christ is your life. Thus his will is my will. Thus his loves are my loves. And it's hard. Here's the ultimate joy. The Rose of Sharon will always speak your name. I don't know why, but the so-called Christian world takes the Rose of Sharon from the Song of Solomon, chapter 2 and verse 1, and like to apply it to Christ. <coughs> I don't believe it's referring to Christ at all. Uh, it's referring to probably the Shunammite woman, <laughs> but, but that's okay. They take it as Solomon to his love, Christ 
to the church. And it's a beautiful thought. So, for this point, I would ask you to tolerate what this singer's theology might be. When he says the Rose of Sharon will always speak his name, he's saying Jesus. Jesus will always speak your name. And what does that mean? We know him, yes, church? The ultimate joy for the Christian's life is the reverse knowledge. Galatians 4 and verse 9. I love how much Paul says at times in, in asides, right? He says, and now, now that you know God, and then he stops and he says, or rather are known by God. You see the difference there? Think of the Matthew 7, 21 through 23. I never knew you, said Jesus. Imagine Jesus knows me. Not only knows me, he knows my name. Well, he's God, of course. I don't mean that. I mean the relationship that I have with my Lord is that intimate that he knows me. And that when he met me, he wouldn't say, oh, Richard, welcome. He wouldn't say that. He'd say, hey, Rick. That he would know me and we would have that relationship. He's done his part. He created all. He died. He walked the walk. He talked the talk. He showed me everything I needed to know. Now it's up to me. And brethren, it is so hard what he asks us to do. It's that transformation. Because he wants me to love like he loves. And brethren, I don't. I try. But there's a hardness in me. He wants me to forgive those I do not want to forgive. But he calls me to it. He calls me to a humbleness and a desire to serve others who have no right to be served. Because that's who he is. Those things, mourning for the lost, willing to give all for Christ desiring nothing more than that intimate relationship that God makes available, that will make me a good and effective servant. If you're not a Christian this morning, God desires this relationship with you. He's given all. He simply stands appealing to you with his hand out. Will you not come? He asks a lot. He asks all. But brethren, he gave you all. Return it and have all. It's not easy. Was Jesus' life easy? I keep thinking about those words of Paul from our study in 1 Corinthians. He said, I desire, and this is from Philippians, I know, but it's tied, trust me. <laughs> he said, I desire to know the fellowship of Jesus' sufferings. Why? So I can partake of his resurrection. What does he say? So I can be with him. It's all about him and that love and that relationship. If you don't have it, why would you deny yourself it? It's yours. Christians, all farther up and further in. Come to Him. He wants all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you've been giving a lot, well, I appreciate that. More and more. How many times do we find that in the writings of Paul? Abounding more and more. Why? Because that's the relationship. Do you want all the glory and all the blessings of God? Give your all to His glory. And it's yours. And make his will and his desire yours. Oh, brethren, Jesus will speak your name. If there's anything we can do to help you in the knowing of God, in the reaching out to others, in whatever you may need, we'd ask, we would beg that you come as together we stand and sing.